The blood pools. They ebb and flow a rancid tide of homogeneous blood and salt water through a series of dark industrial warehouses. This is an absolutely abhorrent place found among the deep guts of limb space adjacent to level one. The overwhelming smell of the mixture flooding the level attracts millions of flies and maggots which live down in the blood and add to its revolting sludge. Travel through the level is made possible only by the metal grated catwalk suspended above. It would be inadvisable at best to try and trek through the blood, for when the incoming tide rises, the pools can quickly reach depths well above your neck. The blood flows into eddies and swirls with a heavy, deadly undertow, carrying creatures that hunt in the swirling muck. With a thriving ecosystem of fish, reptiles, and all manner of entities and horrors surviving within the salty, congealing concoction, you can expect to see bones and husks of creatures floating below as you walk. As the tide sweeps away the pools, these husks and bones are deposited everywhere to dry. They are picked clean by swarms of flies. When the tide returns, the beached catacombs of moist, bloody bones are swept away and stirred back into the seas of gore. It's a never-ending cycle of detestation. To put it simply, this is a level inhuman, churning with death and decay. Its very stink is assaulting, and the constant knowledge of what swirls below you wears away at your mind. If you linger too long, or become too lost within its confines, you will find that there is only madness here. The environment gnaws at the corners of sanity, repressing even the most stalwart of survivors. Porters do not take this route. It was discovered by pilgrims who were denounced from Alpha Point long ago during the first exodus. They stated that life goes here to die. In life, foul things seem to attract other foul things, and so too has the swirling, rotting ocean of blood below the catwalks ensnared a grim population of the Brotherhood. Perhaps their survival in the blood pools was out of desperation at first. I try to give the benefit of the doubt to people here. When face to face with your terminal endpoint, your internal engine screeches so loud and fiercely with an intensity that is outside of the realms of rational thought and action. And I mean true desperation. The animalistic type that would have you screaming in the face of death and clawing through with tooth and nail. Few people come here by choice. We surely didn't when we were banished from our home in level one. Perhaps the lost brothers of Lim who reside here may have met a similar fate, sentenced to wander, or to death in the blood pools, cast out from their own. At that point, your animalistic side is the one that takes the reins, and you ask yourself what you're willing to subject yourself to before accepting your own death. In these situations, people surprise themselves, and they live on. Or, knowing the Brotherhood, perhaps it is some sort of a rite of passage, an initiation ritual meant to teach some sort of eternal humility or grand wisdom. We've seen the end result. The broods of people who stagger out of a lifetime in the blood pools are difficult to consider human. I couldn't imagine living off the bloody scraps and bones that wash up in the salty tide, huddled in the darkness, hiding from the entities. For that to be your entire existence is a certain specific type of hell. The scant population of the Brotherhood that resides here is indeed poorly supplied, ragged, and dismal. That should not suggest you enter the level without caution. They will murder anyone not of their own creed. Whether this violent disposition is learned from survivalist desperation, or due to a murderous pledge to their figurehead Volkov is unknown. They are few and disparate, but have claimed too many lies from the UNCB while documenting this territory as it is. If you walk the catwalks and fear becoming one with the blood pools, always be on the lookout for the oldest and coldest of dangers, your fellow man. The blood pool catwalks exist adjacent to the halls of level 1. They bridge the halls and a number of deeper levels, with rumors suggesting connections to the sub-basement, sunken city, and the endless shopping halls of boundless retail. There may be even more, even deeper connections within, but few are willing to explore these depths to document them. No sane individuals use this level for travel unless they have no other choice. The gradients that blend the blood pool catwalks with other levels are slow, gradual gradients of decay, where walls and floors transition into crumbling concrete and grimy stained metal. 
sewers and pipelines that run underneath the crumbling outskirts of level 14 pour blood endlessly into the pools. Where that blood comes from, no one knows. Simultaneously, slow dripping leaks of salt water from level 8 mingle with the carnage, and that keeps the mixture from coagulating. It's imagined that over time, as more blood endlessly fills the repulsive pit, it will eventually spill out and cover all its connecting levels with tidal waves of frothing crimson gore. A rather grim and unsettling notion, but nonetheless one that may offer insights into the grand design of the backroom system itself. With the remote insights of Dr. Nolan Davis of the GMG, steps to understanding the phenomenon of visitors to the blood pools developing uncontrollable bouts of emotional instability have been made possible. Observed in both explorers and lost rescued wanderers, many who were exposed to the level long term were seen to switch rapidly from states of extreme depression to uncontrollable episodes of laughter and elation. The laughter was pathologic and would come forth in bursts, paired with acute memory loss and reduced motor control during episodes. In a chilling account, they were said to laugh themselves to death. For a very long time, the cause of this madness had left a mystery, labeled an anomalous factor of the level which may never be explained. The laughing lost would in time degrade until there was no spark left, no conscious awareness, and little control over their mind or body. They would succumb to episodes of laughter and delirium until they would, indeed, pass. The blood pools soon received a stark reputation of being cursed. Rumors of ghost possession, anomalous insanity, and other tales stuck the blood pools like a hanging shadow. Tales of bloody madness, zombification, and all manner of folklore developed around the area. Stories spread by porters ensured that even faraway settlements were told to never enter its bloody depths. In time, news of these laughing lost spread through the UNC beyond precursor terminals, until the disease caught the eye of Dr. Davis, a studied professional from Baseline who was able to shed some light on a possible explanation. Recalling medical studies from their time on Earth, Dr. Davis suggested the disease mirrored the widespread depths in Papua New Guinea after practices of funerary cannibalism of the Four Tribe were observed. Known as Kuru, Dr. Davis states it was largely eradicated in the 1950s after the Four stopped eating their dead and practiced more sanitary burial practices. It's been a very long time since medical school, but there is something unsettling about a laughing sickness that you never quite forget about, and we've seen similar things more often than you might imagine. It goes beyond even just the Four Tribe. Depending on when you spliced in, you may remember the term mad cow disease. It's a similar thing, a neurodegenerative disease caused by eating brains, or more specifically, a specific protein in brains, prions if I remember correctly. I wish I had some reference material, you'll have to take my word for it. Regardless, if the description of the level is correct, then there is plenty of raw and exposed blood and carcasses in the blood pools. It would not be a stretch to imagine that contact or consumption of anything in there could cause a host of illnesses. Kuru fits the bill. I wouldn't step in there without a full suit, gloved up and making sure my eyes, ears, mouth, any entrance to my body fully covered. The level is a biohazard stew. All superstition aside, it'll kill you from viral infection if nothing else gets you, assuredly. Despite this account, a curious detail remains. The laughing lost, in death, always display the same patterns of morbid rigor mortis. During their final fit, the ribs crack and compound fracture, exposing the lungs. Additionally, their faces contort into permanent grins as the muscles around the gin contract and pull taut in death. While Dr. Davis may be correct regarding the abundance of viral danger from the area, he had no comment on these effects. As such, rumors of a curse remain. The laughing lost are often disposed of with care and ritual. The grinning, open bodies are unsettling after passing. Most are burned.